This is the Exxon Broadcast Network Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. CNN Enjoy delicacies Network. such as frog legs, spider tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage. News or Radio enjoy Network. the more traditional Angel cuisine Broadcast such as hand-cut Angus steaks, Network. ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern player featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Did you know that when you're on the road North with limited Broadway data or Wi-Fi, you can Felsman. still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic Marsh with Landing. Mulder Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Good evening and welcome to Paranormal Stakeout. I'm your host, Larry Lawson, and we have an exciting show on tap for you tonight. You know, it's my goal to have guests on this show that can give you first-hand accounts of dealing with the paranormal and the unexplained, and folks, tonight is no exception. In fact, our guest's life growing up was so dire, it inspired a major motion picture. It's a great pleasure uh, tonight. We've got Andrea Perone with us on the show. Andre is the author of the Supernatural Trilogy, House of Darkness, House of Light, the true story behind the 2013 feature film, The Conjuring. She's also co-authored the historically-based mystery thriller, In a Flicker, with George R. Lopez. In her travels, she lectures frequently about spirituality, metaphysics, and all things considered paranormal, including concentrating her research in ufology, a lifelong passion bearing new fruit in recent years. Earning a PA degree in philosophy and English from Chatham College in 1980, she has worked several fields as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, youth counselor, actor, while pursuing a variety of eclectic interests over the decades. Currently, Andrea is writing a screenplay of her haunting family saga and is collaborating within the film industry to bring the true story to light on the silver screen. As an outspoken human rights advocate and animal rights activist, all she does, she does with love and always with the best of intentions. It's her fervent desire to spread her positive message to as many as possible, hoping it will resonate with like-minded mortals as she relentlessly strives to dispel fear and bring peace to a troubled planet. Andrea, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's so good to have you on here, ma'am. It's, uh, you know, we've met before. We've had some great times, and, and we're going to be together at the end of the month. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But, wow, The Conjuring. That, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a movie that sparked fear, conversation, talk throughout the country. Uh, tell us, what, what was it like growing up in that situation? Well, uh a great deal of The Conjuring um, has been fictionalized, and it really bears no reasonable resemblance to the way that we grew up or how we lived. We had many uh, very, very happy moments. Um, you know, The Conjuring, is it's impossible to compress 10 years into two hours, and it made it look as if we were there for a relatively short amount of time, that the Warrens came in, solved all of our problems, and we all lived happily ever after. And really, nothing could be further from the truth. The Warrens only came to the house five or perhaps six times um, uh-huh. over the course of about uh, an 18-month period. Uh, and then we didn't see them again. So we lived there another seven years before uh, before we moved. And many things, many, many things happened in the house and, and with our family and in the dynamic 
of our family and how it shifted and how we became a paranormal family uh, to the extent where, you know, you could run past an apparition and, and just notice it and keep going. Mm. Um, it was, it, it almost became a matter of fact way of life. Uh, once the issues were resolved and my mother uh, battled her way back uh, into our family and into uh, a state of mind that was healthy for her because something was definitely after her. And if it couldn't get her to leave the house, it tried to attack her from within. Uh, and it, it was, you know, there was no exorcism in our house. The film makes it look like uh, Ed Warren would never have conducted an exorcism, Larry. I think mm. I remember talking with you about this last year um, yep. down in, uh, at the event. Um, he was, uh, at the time, the only layman in the world who had been trained in the ritual of exorcism through the Roman Catholic Church. Church. And he had such a, a deep and abiding devotion for the church. He would never have overstepped his bounds. In fact, when Lorraine and I watched the movie together three months prior to its release, she said that. Um, she said, Ed would never have done that. Uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't know they were putting that in the movie. Uh, she said, I, Ed would never have done that um, to wow. try to conduct an exorcism on his own. And she was crying and I was handing her tissues and it was, you know, very emotional for her. And that's a very emotional scene, but nothing like that occurred in our home. And well, this was Hollywood doing what they feel that they need to do, which I think is unfair. To, uh, they don't give people enough credit for intelligence. If they had actually shown what did occur that night during a seance, um, I think that it would have run people out of the theater. It would have terrified them. It well, I, I, and I, way worse. And I guess that's why you're getting ready to tell that story again, and we're going to get into that in le just a little bit. I know you discussed quite a bit of this with me down in, when you were down at Felsmere, Florida, for our first annual um Para Unity Conference there. We're going to be back doing that again the end of January. You'll be coming back down to visit us again. Well, hey, we're going to have well, a great time. Andrea, we're going to have to take our first break here, uh, and then we're going to finish this conversation. I'd like everybody to take a look at her website, www.houseofdarknesshouseoflight.com, and we'll be back in just a few seconds after these important messages. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. Are you interested in the paranormal, ghosts, UFOs, or psychic phenomenon? Join me, Tim Bartley, co-host of Talking to Spirits with Lightworkers Tim and Justina, coming mid-January 2017 to the XZBN. We will channel spirits live and talk to them, revealing all kinds of amazing information. Spiritual attachments will be found and removed on the show, and so much more. To find out when you can listen to Talking to Spirits with Lightworkers Tim and Justina, visit www.xzbn.net for listeners on both sides of the veil.
Welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout. This is your host, Larry Lawson, and we are speaking with Andrea Perone, the author of House of Darkness, House of Light, the the book that inspired the movie The Conjuring. And Andrea, it's just such a thrill to have you with us tonight. So many questions. And I know we've talked when you were down here in Felsmere, Florida with us last year, and we're going to talk some more. But I, I'd like to ask you, why did you finally decide to tell your family's story? Well, we waited about 30 years, a little bit. I, I started writing uh, the story down uh, from my own perspective in August of 2007. Um, and it was published, the last of the trilogy, the uh, volume three was published uh, seven years to the day that I began the project. Um, so I believe in, you know, cosmic consciousness. And I think that there was some reason, for some reason, seven members in my family, seven years to the day to get the whole story out into the world. It was uh, profound in its synchronicity. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, I can't really tell you why uh, the time came. It was just everything converged at once. Uh, I started uh, on my vacation from my job. I had a great job that I loved. Uh, and I worked in the theater company of Rhode Island, had been a cast member for 20 years. Uh, so I had a very staid, um, uh, wonderful and comfortable life up in Rhode Island. And I turned in my notice at work and gave up everything, uh, lived off my 403B for a while uh, and put everything on the line to tell our family's story. And I can't tell you why I did it other than a bell went off in my head and it said it's time. And a real leap of faith. I loved yeah, it was. Everything I loved, I walked away from, packed up everything I owned in a U-Haul with my big dog and my big cat and moved in with my mother and my sister um, in a farmhouse in uh, Georgia. And this is where I wrote the books, right where I'm sitting at this moment. Um, it's home to me and it feels wonderful. And now I'm here working with my mother and three of my sisters on uh, making sure we've got the chronology um, correct because I've got a three movie deal for uh, the for the trilogy and um, trying to compile the screenplay and give my producer something <laughs> that we can work with to get this thing done. <laughs> oh, it's a massive amount of work. That's probably why I'm so tired. But uh, I'm good. Well, I'm doing. You know, it's my job. It's my job in the universe to get this story out into the world that profoundly touches people's lives. Well, we're going to look forward to seeing that. Um, now, you, you mentioned before that the first movie just didn't, there was just not a lot of truth to it in some areas. Well, when it did you... scratched the surface, really, Larry. It was, um, it was like 2% of what actually happened to us, for one thing. And then what was accurate was distorted. Um, you know, it wasn't um, crows flying into the house it was um bats and i don't know why they didn't just use the bats because they know that's part of the story you know they read my books they knew but the film wasn't based on the books it was based on the case files of ed and lorraine warren that's why conjuring 2 which is the enfield poltergeist cases a case that they investigated in england um so and there will be a third and a fourth as far as i know so this is a franchise, but it's about the Warrens. And the reason they chose to tell our story first was because Ed Warren, uh, before he passed away, uh, is on record as saying it was the most intense, disturbing, compelling, and significant of all of the cases that they ever uh, conducted uh, during the course of their 40-year career as paranormal investigators. Wow. Well, well it, is it possible, can you share with us a, a snippet of probably the most intense or significant true life event that occurred? Uh, you know, Paranormal Witness did a show with us. Uh, they interviewed five of the seven of us, and they got closer to accurate. But still, even with that, it's such it's a 1,500-page uh, 
three volume set and and even that doesn't cover everything i just couldn't write forever you know sure sure <laughs> um, I, at some point i had to rein it in and say you know put in the, in there and and this happened over and over again over the course of 10 years you know because otherwise you know it would be a lot of the way that spirit manifests is very specific um, i have learned over the course of my lifetime uh, and it's based on how much energy uh, an entity is able to muster from what environment and well, so what what, what they, was the entity in your house what what was it there were at least a dozen uh spirits in the house that uh routinely manifested in various forms so sometimes we couldn't tell who it was and sometimes we could clearly tell who it was mm -hmm. um it just depended on uh I guess it depends on, an, you know, a number of factors. I wish I had all the answers. I really do. I mean, that would be great if I had all the answers, but there are no experts in this field. If my no, family that is so know, true. then nobody knows. Nobody knows, including the Warrens, including Hans Holzer, including, including. Um, it's weird. This is a field of study that is considered uh, pseudoscience. You know, it's uh, paranormal is not given... Uh, the the um, the weight and dignity that it deserves when we're talking about something as as integral to life as life and death. Now, is there an afterlife? If there is, what does it look like? How do we know this exists? Why do some people see it and some people don't? Um, you know, and as as over the years, uh, information compiles in terms of evidence collected. And, and anecdotal evidence, mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it makes a good case and a good argument um, for the existence of spirit and in an alternate dimension that some people can tap into and others shut out or are just incapable of that type of receptivity. And as we've uh, talked now, and as we've talked before, that's one of the foundations of this show is uh, my vision to at some point reach a period in time where we can collect this evidence and we can uh, put it together in such a way as to prove the existence. So between what the work that you do and what many other folks in the field do, I feel confident we're going to reach that level of stopping, stop becoming a pseudoscience and be considered legitimate science. That's my goal anyway. I think that um, that's uh, a wonderful goal to have. And I really admire the work that you do. Uh, you know, knowing you personally, knowing your mother personally, uh, has been a joy in my life. Your mother is lovely, by the way. My father <laughs> is looking forward to talking to her again. So she's a trip. She said to say hello, by the way. I did. She said to say hello to you tonight, by the way. she's My mom's quite a trip. Uh, any of you that join us in uh, Felsmere in the end of January, you'll get a chance to meet mom, and she is a trip, no doubt about it. Um, uh, the well, spirit. You know, go ahead. No, go ahead, honey. I'm sorry. No, the spirits in your house, did, did you find human, non-human, both? Uh, human. Okay. Um, definitely human uh, for the most part, other than the night of the seance where my mother was attacked by something that was just pure, unadulterated evil. I don't know. I, I hesitate to call it a demon. I don't know what a demon is. I've never seen a demon. Um, and I think that that word gets thrown around an awful lot, and I don't understand why people have such a proclivity for wanting to label things good and bad. You know, life is, is a series of post-it notes, but they don't always apply, and we don't know what we're talking about. You know, I think the safest assumption for us to make uh, is to begin with the knowledge that we know nothing compared to what there is to know. And that's a really good uh, leaping off place because um, this is in many ways a matter of faith and going on faith. I have, I have more evidence than anybody, you know, in terms of m me being convinced, me personally being convinced of the existence of spirit. It's a given. It's, it's just so much a part of my life that it's perfectly normal. I don't even like to use the word paranormal or supernatural because 
that I think that they misrepresent something that is actually perfectly normal and has always existed and has been, as you go as far back as literature exists and you will find stories of ghosts, you know, it sure. is, it's a part of our humanity and it's part of the mystery of life. And to me, it is the most incredible comfort to know that it's not just ashes to ashes, dust to dust, that we go on beyond our mortal existence, that we return to the realm that I suspect we came from in the first place. And that the old adage that was a bumper sticker for so long about having, you know, a human experience, um, uh, a temporary human experience is true. It's actually true. It's why it became a cliche because it's true. We come from the realm of spirit. We return to the realm of spirit. Energy uh, just transmutes and it transforms, but it, it never dissipates. And that we have a soul and that we are a living spirit, that we are God consciousness in action on this planet at this time. And we are the way God sees the world it created. Um, you know, and to me, it's very faith-based. It's not just quantum physics. It's not quantum mechanics exclusively. You know, my friend George and I wrote In a Flicker Together, which is a fascinating book and has a lot to do with the CERN uh, Large Hadron Collider um, in Satigny, Switzerland. Um, and, um, you know, we're both very fascinated by uh, the science of what mm -hmm. we study. But we also lecture together about the merging of science and spirituality and how that's where the answers will come. But Nikola Tesla was correct when he said that it's, you know, the merging of these two very specific uh, fields of study that will yield uh, more information in a decade than has been accumulated throughout the course of human history. Well, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to be going to our next break. And when we come back, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that because it's kind of a little bit of a departure from the paranormal genre in, in such a, a little bit. I'd like to talk to you more about that. Uh, okay. Folks uh, folks can get a hold of you at uh, House of Darkness, House of Light com, and in a flicker novel dot com, correct? Yes. And, but the fastest, best way for anybody to reach me is mm -hmm. on Facebook. I am the Facebook queen. I have five pages on Facebook, uh, not only my book and author page, but my personal page, and anybody could message me there. Um, and um, I'm full up on friends usually, but I've got a couple of openings right now. I cleaned house a little bit, so uh, anybody can reach me there. And on my uh, In a Flicker fan page, uh, on my show, A World Awakening, uh, my radio show that I did with George, that page is up and running and also my fan page, which is called the Buttercup Brigade. So there's a lot of ways to reach me. Yeah, you're, you definitely are easy to get a hold of, and you're very open to everybody, too, and that's, that's truly appreciated. Um, also, when we come back, I want to talk to you about another angle that people don't really connect with you, and that's your interest in UFOs and ufology. So I'm, I'm anxious to talk with you about that a little bit also. I do want to take a moment to tell our listeners to check on... Our website, www.xzbn.net, for program scheduling. And certainly you can find me on there, uh, Larry Lawson, your host. And we're going to take our next break here and be back on the other side. Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net.
Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout with your host, Larry Lawson. And tonight we have Andrea Perron here, and we're just having a great conversation. Um, Andrea, just before the last break, we were discussing your um, your other book, In a Flicker, uh, with uh, George Lopez. Mm-hmm. Interesting because it's a little bit of a departure from what people really uh, see you as as an author. Can, can you tell me a little bit more about why you went in that direction and how it's actually connected to the paranormal? Uh, well, it is, um, I'm as proud of In a Flicker as I am of House of Darkness, House of Light. And they couldn't be more disparate. They are completely different from one another. Uh, there is a little bit of a rather wicked supernatural twist to In a Flicker, but it is not what would be considered a paranormal book. It's a history uh, amalgamated with mystery, amalgamated with uh, fact and fiction that blend to such an extent that it is impossible to distinguish which is which at certain points. Uh-huh. Um, it's an uh, absolutely fascinating read. Uh, it has um, elements. It's gruesome and horrible in many ways. In other ways, it's absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, It's everything, all wrapped up in one 400-page book that will take you on a journey unlike anything you've ever experienced before. And I can brag shamelessly about this story because this was George's idea. Uh, And it came to him. um, He told me about it uh, a couple of years ago, and I was immediately on board, and there was a reason why. Uh, this, as a woman, this story uh, had a very uh, significant impact on me, and I felt that I had to be involved with getting this story out into the world. Um, if you were to walk up to anybody on the street and say, "Have you ever heard of Jack the Ripper?" They would, anybody would say yes. But if you asked those same people if they could name any of his victims they wouldn't be able to name one. And when you're done reading in a flicker, you'll know these women, you'll know their story. It will touch you to the core. And it is an entirely different take. And as far as I am concerned, the only plausible reason why he was never apprehended. Interesting. So correct me if I'm wrong here. So you're connecting this story to Jack the Ripper, or are you just using that as an example? Oh, no, this is about Jack the Ripper and so much more. Interesting. So much more. It's a real psychological drama that will take you on an emotional journey that you'll never recover from, not in this lifetime. I mean, our readers are saying, I am haunted by these characters. I, you know, I, I, if I have fallen in love. I have fallen in hate. I have fallen, you know, just fallen. Uh, it takes, I mean, people are, are, the reviews we're getting are just stellar, nothing but five-star reviews from around the world. Uh, I'm very, very proud of it. It's an incredible uh, story, and I am certain, I'm absolutely certain that it will be made into a film. But, uh, you know, the book's always better, so I encourage okay. everybody in, with in a flicker to read it. Yeah, in a flicker. We'll see, we'll see that soon. for it. Yeah, okay. and it's got some really sexy stuff in it, too, you know, and uh, that shocks some of my readers, you know, that know me from the trilogy. 
because mm-hmm. uh, it's it's just uh, it's it's not for children. It's not for anybody who is emotionally immature uh, or easily uh, uh, you know drawn in psychologically to things. Uh, it's it's for strong-minded, not for the faint of heart or the weak of stomach. It is mm-hmm. a true story of what happened. Um, the worst of it is derived mm-hmm. directly from the annals of history. Interesting, interesting. I, are there any specific paranormal events that are attached to this book? Anything, anything that you personally experienced are you putting as part of the book? Uh, no, um, other than uh, the things the weirdest things that have happened around in a flicker. Uh, Many things have happened to many people uh, around the trilogy. House of Mm -hmm. Darkness, House of Light has a profound effect on people that read it. Some people hate it. They think that it's just supposed to be nothing but a series of scary stories. And it's Mm -hmm. so, so much more than that. So I wrote it for what my publisher said was, uh, you know, the intelligentsia. This is, my books are studied in coursework in colleges mm-hmm. and universities, not just for the for the um, story, but for the text, for the for the well, literature. Well, um, let me ask. And, let me ask you this question. Interactive. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you. Based upon your your obvious experiences as a child growing up and now as an author, has this uh, propelled you to actually become involved in investigations or perhaps? Um, on the fringe of an ex, uh, investigation from a spiritual side? Have you actually, what, have you worked with investigators at all as a result of all of this? Yes, in fact, um, I was uh, for a while uh, considered myself an apprentice of George. I now have my own spirit box. Uh, I, I started with uh, doing spirit box investigation with George um, and it was extremely fruitful. Uh, just shocking, um, the ease, the open connection uh, that I have. Um, and when I do investigations, I go to a lot of different events during the course of the year, and very often um, there is an investigation that's attached in some mm-hmm. way to the event. When I went to Gettysburg, I did an overnight at Pennhurst. When I went to, um, you know, that type of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it's when I went to Petoskey, we were up half the night investigating an old hotel. Uh, it was uh, Michigan. It's fascinating. By have the way, it, really. have any of in any of these investigations have any of the spirits that troubled you as a child reconnected with you? They didn't trouble me. I never really had any trouble with any of them. Um, mm. I felt more at home with them, I think, than anybody in the family. Uh, and sometimes felt more like them than human. Uh, and I can't explain that. Um, it's just how it was. That's the only place I've ever felt home in my life. Everything else has felt temporary. But the farm is home. Uh, I and it always will be. Now, uh, you, it, you've talked, my mom you've talked, said they bought the house because of me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you talked a lot about George, George Lopez, I, I assume. What, how did you get to know George? What's his connection with you? And is, is he a, a paranormal investigator? Is he a medium? Can you tell me a little bit more about him? George is, uh, he's absolutely brilliant. Uh, when he told me the story that had been planted in his mind 25 years before, and I said, this has to be, you have to write this down. This has to be a book. Um, mm-hmm. He said, I'm not a writer. I said, I am. I'll help you. I devoted 18 months of my life to make sure that In a Flicker went out to the world because I believe so strongly in the story. It's a transformational consciousness expanding story in much the same way that the trilogy is. Is he is an entirely different perspective, but he is an investigator. He has his um, he has his own radio network for nine years. Just gave it up to pursue uh, a different avenue of investigation and research into um, oh, okay. consciousness, uh, using uh, the mind. He was trained uh, in military intelligence and served our country well in Europe during the Cold War. And mm-hmm. um, he is uh, an extreme, he's, he's just brilliant. He's a genius. Well, and the, uh, 
he's also, I think he's also a medium, but don't tell anybody I said that. No, we'll keep it our secret, okay? Yeah. Well, this, yeah, this, is a great, this, this is kind of a great uh, intro into the next thing that I, I found interesting in your bio, and I didn't even know this until I read it, is your interest in UFOs. How does that connect to all of this? What, what is your interest? What, are, what studies have you done on, on UFOlogy? Uh, I had my first experience um, that was a total mind explosion when I was 13 years old uh, at the farm. And um, I didn't even tell my mother about it for years after it happened. Uh, I didn't tell her until she saw something uh, at the farm. And then I told her what I had seen years before. But um, it changed everything. It was my personal paradigm shift that occurred when I was 13 and I'm 58. Uh, it's been a part of my life, all of my life. I'm a contactee. I'm an experiencer. I don't believe that uh, I have ever been quote unquote abducted. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it seems to me that as open-minded as I am, that I would remember something like that. But um, I, part of my job on planet earth is to assure people that we are not alone in the universe and that those that I am in contact with and that I have a special affinity for are absolutely and entirely benevolent and are not here to save us, but are here to make their presence known so that we can expand our own minds what and was, save well, ourselves from ourselves. What experience did you have? Uh, that's, that's what I'd love to hear about this. What experience did you have with an extraterrestrial or, or with contact? Well, I've had numerous experiences over the course of my life. In the last 10 years, they have increased exponentially to the extent that it is, again, a normal part of my life, not paranormal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the first experience that I had was uh, standing in the front yard at the farm and watching an entire flotilla of ships pass over. Uh, overhead, um, completely and utterly silent. Uh, the large, the largest ship was so large that, uh, as a vessel, I don't know if I could compare it to Giant Stadium or to Manhattan because I was young and I don't know in terms of depth perception how far away it was, but it was enormous and it blocked out the sun and passed silently overhead, and it took 30 years before I found out that I was one of thousands and thousands of people that saw it pass uh, over from Prince Edward Island to Maryland, and then it crossed the Atlantic, and it made a tour of Western Europe and disappeared over the North Pole when the British mm -hmm. Royal Air Force scrambled to wow. scramble its jet fighters. But I didn't know that for 30 years, that I was one of thousands. But here's the thing, Larry. That thing passed over millions and millions and millions of people. And thousands of us saw it. And probably thousands more saw it and never said anything. But have why you, didn't everyone see it? Well, and that's what i got to ask you. There's that uh, uh, MUFON, for example, that, that investigates these types of things. Any contact with them? I mean, this sounds like something that they would absolutely jump on. Oh, they love me. <laughs> oh, I have I have lots of friends that move on. Uh, it's a great organization. Uh, there's a the national and international chapter, and then there's of course the state chapters. Uh, lots of activity with MUFON. They're doing great work, and they're documenting many, many things, but they well, don't even really bother to document my stuff. I've just got too much. I lecture at uh, – uh, I'll be out at the Star Wars Symposium um, speaking in November, uh, and we'll be doing several other events throughout the year uh, about – my experiences. Well, UFOs. we're going to have to go to our la last break here in just a second. When we come back, I'd like to talk to you about hearing a little bit more about uh, reporting this. So we'll be back in just a minute. We're with Andrea Perone, House of Darkness, House of Light.com. This is your host, Larry Lawson. Be back after these messages.
Hi, I'm Larry Lawson, host of Paranormal Stakeout. With over 36 years in law enforcement, I have learned a few things. The most important is the proper gathering and preservation of evidence is vital to putting the bad guy behind bars. It's no different in the world of paranormal investigation, whether it's the search for the afterlife, cryptozoology, UFOs, and extraterrestrials. How we gather the evidence, preserve that evidence, and present it to a jury of our peers will make the ultimate difference in proving the existence of worlds and entities that are beyond our imagination. Join me, Larry Lawson, every week on Paranormal Stakeout when, along with my guests, we'll take a journey to prove with indisputable evidence what man has struggled to believe for centuries. Go to xzbn.net for the broadcast schedule and check me out at paranormalstakeout.com. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Welcome back to Paranormal Stakeout. Larry Lawson, your host here, and we're, we've got Andrea Perone online with us and having an unbelievable conversation. Andrea, this, this event that you were involved with, with UFO, how, how many years ago was that? Uh, I was 13, um, and I'm 58, so you'll have to do the math. I'm tired, <laughs> but uh, it was many decades ago. Uh, and, you know, and what prompted that for me was when you asked about uh, doing paranormal investigation, I do it for the people that are coming because I always bring my own spirits with me. And mm-hmm. so no matter what, something's going to happen, although it does skew investigations for me to be there sometimes because you can't distinguish, you know, one spirit from another or who came with whom. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's, um, especially when I'm with people like Chip Coffee and people like that, you know, it's like it gets very, it muddies oh, the water. very muddled, it gets very yeah. Very convoluted, yes. yeah. Um, but uh, it's, uh, to me, um, it's not fruitless, but that's not where my research lies because I already know that spirit exists. So I'm hunting quote unquote, for something that I know exists. Um, And in the same way, uh, in terms of my research and my work um, uh, with uh, extraterrestrial engagement with humanity, Mm -hmm. I don't consider it research per se. I consider it interaction. And um, to me, that is a form of research. And I do document what I see and what experiences I have. Um, and that other members of my family have had. But I don't understand the things that I research are, uh, for instance, um, the Rh negative blood factor and mm-hmm. when that first appeared in the human race, which was approximately 60,000 years ago. Human blood right. does not mutate. It was introduced into the human bloodline. Interesting. And it's incompatible well, with human blood. I have it. So does every member of my family. Interesting. Well, let, let me ask you this question, because this, to me, this sparks a very interesting thought in my mind. Do you see a correlation between the spirit world and the UFO world? Yes, uh, I see correlation and integration, and that does not mean that they're holding hands. What it means is that they are extra dimensional, that we mm-hmm. don't live in a three dimensional, five sensory um, world. We live in a multi sensory, multi dimensional universe. And I have seen and know for a fact that um, vessels can come into this dimension and leave this dimension in a matter of split seconds. 
Um, I've seen it with my own eyes time and time and time again. I trust my own senses, um, mm-hmm. but I also trust the, the messages that I receive as well. And that's telepathic in nature for the most part. Uh, but then again, so was our interaction with the spirits. Um, when they spoke to us, it was very clear what was being said, but it was not being spoken aloud in the room. It was being spoken mind to mind. This is interdimensional, uh, multidimensional living. And we had to learn to live like that. And that's not something that ever leaves you. Once that door is kicked wide open, you might as well just have ripped it off the hinges. It's never going to go back. It's never going to close. And you can pretend that you didn't have those experiences. You can turn your back on it. But eventually, something will reach through that door and tap you on the shoulder and remind you of its presence in your universe, in your world. Um, Mm -hmm. And I consider it a blessing, not a curse. And my mother, who went through hell in that house with one spirit that just did not want her there, told her over and over again, get out in every conceivable way that she could. Um, So is it... uh, Still a blessing because it was proof of the existence of something beyond our mortal. Uh, life. So let's let's roll back to what you suffered, what you went through as a child. Then let's roll back. Do you at age thirteen you see you you have your first UFO experience? During that time, you're going through that that horrible time in your home. So we're, what what you're saying is they're connected, perhaps somehow dimensionally. The the Perhaps the uh, appearance of the UFOs as well as the events occurring in the house, you, you think they're connected then? Uh, I, that was my first conscious realization of seeing something that was otherwise inexplicable. Mm-hmm. You know, vessels that I knew were not made on this planet. Um, and, you know, I was intellectually precocious as a child. I was very well read. By the age of 13, I had read a lot of the classics. Uh, I was, in many ways, intellectually prepared. I was not emotionally prepared to see what I saw. Um, I didn't tell my mother for a very long time because she was dealing with her own issues. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand why in a household of seven people that I happened to be the only one on the front lawn when it occurred. I mean, that was a rarity that we we weren't together doing something. Um, And I don't know why the color of the sky changed the way that it did, why the clouds appeared suddenly the way that they did. What, you know, it was, it it passed over me within, I would say, um, a matter of seconds, really. It was moving very slowly, but it was, it was passed over, I would say, probably within 20 seconds. But that 20 seconds changed my life. It changed everything about my life, my understanding um, that that we are so not alone. It's ridiculous well, how not alone we are. I mean, you, you, you watch the movie The Conjuring, you immediately think of the spirit world. But this, is, this has got to be the first time that I've heard of that connection, perhaps being not only with the spirit world, but other worlds. Uh, other I, I think that it, it's possible, however, that um, it was because of our exposure and overexposure to spirit in uh-huh. the farmhouse that really opened up my third eye, that prepared me to see what I saw in the sky after I had seen what I'd seen in the house. Um, and that was and that was early on. I mean, we moved there when um, I was 12 years old. So we'd only been in the house about not even a year when this occurred um, out of our 10-year stay. So, uh, And then over the years, we saw a number of things happen on that property. And it was very easy to see the sky and what was going on in the mm-hmm. sky uh, because there were no lights. I mean, it was as remote as remote gets. And, and now, did, no the, did the local lights. press cover this at all? Uh, no, we didn't tell anybody. We didn't tell anybody. No. <laughs> wow. That was, I mean, we were already considered considered the weird people that lived in the old haunted house up on Round Top. You know, yeah, it was, but it sounds like yeah, thousands was, of people may have seen this. That's the only thing I'm, th- I'm wondering. Uh, yes, yes. Many, many, many people reported it. But, you know, think back in, in time. That was 1972. 
mm-hmm. uh, or 71 when that happened. And um, uh, people didn't report these things. This was considered even more taboo than ghosts and spirits. Um, well, it was just not a subject that people wanted to talk about or report about, and it was just considered crazy. And yeah. we already had a reputation that we were fighting uh, and we had been told to keep our mouths shut at school and not talk about what was happening in our house. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was it was uh, not something that anybody disclosed. And yes, I found out many years later that many thousands of people reported seeing things and that there were uh, seeing that flotilla and well, that there were a number of different reports up and down the eastern seaboard uh, and all over Europe. Um, yeah. But this was stuff that was kept under wraps well, because I've got they to, you know, didn't want to have a panic, a, you know, a public panic. Sure. I've got to tell you, Andrew, this gives me a whole new perspective of you. Um, this, is, this is fascinating stuff. I, I, I never had... Would have even thought about the um, connection between the two, but let's let's move on a little bit. We're we're getting towards the end of our time, and I'd really like to know what 2017 has in store for you. I mean, brand new year, the world's changing. What does 2017 have in store for Andrea Peron? Well, the world is certainly changing, and uh, a lot of what I'll be doing this year uh, is not only. Um, finishing my screenplays and getting the movies made, the true story, um, but uh, also lecturing at uh, Star Wars Symposium uh, out in Laughlin, Nevada. I will be on the Queen Mary uh, talking about this and many other things uh, in March um, for Strange Escapes. I'll be in Salisbury with you in a couple of weeks. Um, in February, I will be at TerrorCon in Providence, Rhode Island. So I get to go home for a couple of days, and that will be great. Uh, and I'm not doing – I'm doing an event in Chicago. I'll be at Sault Ste. Marie uh, for the Upper Michigan Paracon um, mm-hmm. in August and then back to Petoskey in October. Uh, I'm doing about maybe 10 events this year. My and goodness. That's it. Because the rest well, of my time is going to be done with the movies. Well, and you're going to be joining us at the second annual Para Unity Conference in, in Felsmere, Florida, the uh, last weekend of January. We're going to be happy to see you there. Um, mm-hmm. Andrea, we're getting close to the end of our time here. Uh, I I really appreciate you coming on, sharing these uh these stories, these revelations with us. Uh, once again, your website uh, www. Uh, House of Darkness, House of Light.com, and in a flicker novel.com. I'm sure we'll be seeing a, a few more uh, dot coms come from you shortly with some of the other things you have going, and certainly Facebook, right? That's the easiest way for people to get a hold of you? It really is. I'm so accessible on Facebook. It's ridiculous. And I'd also like to invite our listeners check out uh, the X Zone Broadcast Network uh, program schedule at www xzbn.net you can find me there at www.paranormalstakeout.com or my team's website at www.paranormalfbi.com Andrea it's been a pleasure and an honor having you on tonight I'm looking forward to seeing you in the end of the month thank you folks for listening we'll see you next week on Paranormal Stakeout <laughs>